So we've got people coming in. I'm trying to, I'm going to do synth spotting. What's the... Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm just trying to spot Benoit Pelletier's. I'm just trying to work out what synths he's got in the background. Spot the synth. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Everyone who's just joining us, we are going to take a few more minutes to just let everyone get comfortable, grab a beer or a coffee or a tea, a snack. Um, yes, Christian, good for you. It's been a long <laughs> day. <laughs> Bishy, Bishy. Wow, a long time no see. How are you doing? <gasps> she can't unmute. We set it up. <laughs> Wow, Hi, it's lovely to see you. <laughs> so, where, where's everybody uh, chiming in from? Zooming in, Ecuador, Nashville. Oh, yes, Adam, I saw you on our last Zoom. Welcome back. Thank you for being here again. At London, Texas, Salt Lake City, Edinburgh, France. Who's in Edinburgh, Miriam? Is that uh, just Jeremy Horton? Yes, Jeremy was here as well on our last ah. Zoom. I love great members. Welcome back, everybody. It's looking suitably murky, Jeremy. So there, there, is, there is Edinburgh out the back here. Can I know from New York? It's, um, I don't know if you can see that, but that's very much autumn in Scotland for those of you who are oh. lamenting the heat. I'm so jealous. I miss sweater weather. All right. <sighs> Great modular setup, sir. Oh no, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, no. Maddie says it's quite confronting seeing your studio from this angle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and not too many new lockdown toys. My my favorite new thing is this which is the uh, four track recorder that I kind of started my, my career in music on. Um, <laughs> but not the exact same, I mean, the same model, not the exact same one. It's full of like this brown dust that looks like, I don't know, maybe it's like was used in Phoenix or something, Arizona. Um, but it, it, this has cost me three times what I paid for it in 1900 and frozen to death. So incredible. Amazing, amazing. It's a silly toy. Right, I gotta... Hi there, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio. Uh, welcome to another Spitfire Audio Summer Masterclass. Thanks so much for joining me. And thanks to a select few who have joined me via Zoom who are going to be asking me questions along the way, mediated by Miriam, our MD of Spitfire. What is it? It's Spitfire Audio. What's the name of us in America? Spitfire Audio USA. That's us. Like it very Go much. USA. Excellent stuff. So thanks again for joining. And, and hopefully the crowd that are here are going to ask questions that uh, you would want to be asked. But also I'm going to be live on live chat. So make sure the live chat window is open on YouTube. And if you're watching after the event, uh, then just be sure to open the live chat uh, to look at how the conversation went. They say a bad workman blames his tools, but there really is a massive latency with Zoom. So when I start doing some of like the short passages it's um, not because I'm utterly atrocious well, I'm not a very good piano player but it's uh, it's because uh, there is a latency so there will be um, I'll have to use quantize so what are we looking at today so just a little bit of a warning uh, I'm not a natural public speaker um, so when I get nervous, uh, I, I think it's advisable to suggest that I may swear. Apologies in advance for that. Not angrily, but just in a, in a nervous uh, manner. We're looking today at the 10 rules of electronic orchestration or the 10 golden rules of orchestral programming. So for many of you, this is going to feel like going right back to kindergarten. I'm hoping that for those of you who are experienced, there'll be just maybe a little bit of a refresher kind of element to this, uh, a way of maybe thinking about things in a way that you hadn't done. Um, so do stick around, even if at the beginning it sounds uh, very basic. So I think the first thing we should talk about is 
the fear. And I think this is just something that is inherent to orchestral music. And I would just request the first thing to do before even adopting the rules is to try and chuck away any innate fear you have of orchestral. It is still, in this day and age, considered to be a very kind of, um, dare I say it, kind of upper class. Uh, people of privilege, people who go to the conservatoire, having to read music, understanding the, 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 the theory of music. It isn't entirely necessary. Um, I do respect and, and humbly um, uh, congratulate people who do go to music college. But music for me is, is a, just a basic kind of human need to express ourselves. And I really don't think that you should feel um, that you can't work with an orchestra or orchestral music just because you haven't been to the conservatoire. We recently, for our Composer magazine, interviewed the fantastic film composer Terence Blanchard. And I thought it was really helpful for me and in fact gave me confidence to actually do this masterclass. I suffer from imposter syndrome, something rotten whenever I do these. And what he said about orchestration is it's just colouring in. And I think that's a fantastic way of looking at it. We are capable of writing music. We're capable of sitting at a piano or a guitar or a sitar bishy and writing a piece of music. Um, translating it into orchestras is just a decision process of, I would say maybe I would extend on Terence's uh, idea of colouring, but also shading and details and maybe just advancing your composition by uh, the, 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 the stuff that orchestral brings to you, the inspiration that you get from working with or orchestral instruments. I myself cannot read music. I still have to say, get buggered down Fulham Airport for the bass clef. And um, I didn't go to music college. In fact, the school I went to, this is my actual school. And I didn't wear the check trousers, but I did have flares like that when I was at Holland Park School, not prison, in late 1970s, early 1980s. So I'm from an inner city um, background and I've made a career that I believe is moderately successful in music for media. I've done a bunch of films and TV shows, including Poirot, which for someone who doesn't read music, I was pinching myself when I was doing that series. So all I'm saying is don't feel that your background um, kind of ring fences you away from doing orchestral. We're part of a revolution and uh, this is fantastic. And I think that what always happens with revolutions is, is about people suppressing our access to knowledge, to information. And I think that what's great about the revolution we're a part of is we're a massive community that can speak to each other and there's so much we can learn from each other. So this is just my take on the very basics of uh, orchestral uh, programming and hopefully a few new ideas for those of you who are experienced at this. So let's start with ensembles for life. Um, a lot of us, I think, we fear going, well, what do I start with? Do I start with a violin or with a cello or do I start with a, a voice? And from all of the composers that I meet, everyone starts with something to write with. I think that we kind of have to put our two hats on here. And that's why it's so great to have, you know, orchestrators help us with this stuff when we need it, is the writing is, is one part of what we do. The orchestration is another. So I'm just going to stick something down on a piano. And that's maybe the thing that a lot of us use to write with. <laughs> So a very simple part there. I've written that on the piano and it's basically that is my ensemble. That is what I'm used to. But also I have favourite kind of string sounds and it's quite interesting when I speak to uh, uh, composers how often um, they will say, well, I use this Korg M50 sound. I uh, used to write with um, vocal, a choir patch, and I find that that in itself, if it works on vocals, it'll probably work with strings. But let me just pull up a string ensemble here and just start with this. All I'm trying to say is nothing to be ashamed about starting with ensembles and just using it like a synth. These are the Albion Neo Consorts. A nice kind of soft um, uh, sound there. I'm gonna play exactly the same part, but play it idiomatically for the sound. So try and join those notes up a bit, not use the sustain pedal.
just quantized it there just to get it in time because of this uh, latency. I will uh, come back to timing in a moment. But that's basically it. Your first step at orchestral programming is finding an ensemble patch so you're not working with the different sections like your first and second violins, your violas, cellos and basses. You're just working with a, a string synth patch, if you will. So I'm going to move on to the next rule. Do we have any questions yet, Miriam? No, nope. we have uh, a few comments about the piano being a good place to start. Um... And Bishi, like, you know, gave some props for Holland Park. Comprehensive massing. <laughs> Next up, articulate. These are, uh, I guess, playing styles. And you'll see with this, we've got all of these different buttons. There are so many different ways in which you can play uh, an instrument. And when thinking about conjuring a spirit, taking your composition, the way in which it plays is, is often as important as the notes that you've written. So what I'm going to do is, is just take you through a few different articulations and show you the huge differences in sounds that you get with strings. Say, for example, we have plucked strings. So the heart is there, the spirit is there, the story is still there of what I'm trying to say, but maybe we're feeling a little bit jollier, less reflective about the thing or person that we're thinking about. One of my favourite sounds is something that we've developed over many years with Spitfire called Flautando. And again, it isn't an advert, it's just something that I've really been working on string players to create, which is something that's almost harmonic-like. Every sound you use will have a, a slightly different way of well, I request a different way of interacting with it. So I often find that playing the individual sounds in according to what articulation you're using is a good kind of practice. So let's lay this in one more time. Great. So that's articulations. Again, I'm just quantizing that because of the latency. I'll return to that momentarily. So that's it for art articulations. On to the next rule. Miriam, any questions there? Yeah, sounds good. Um, although there was a question about um, voicing. When does that come into the picture? Are we are we too early? Are we jumping We're ahead? too early. I don't know if, about you who are present, but I find voicing... Uh, scary, and we shouldn't be scared of it at all. But I will return to that. It's one of the rules, but we'll get there after a bit more fun. So, Maddie said that the flotando is just awe inspiring, gives them chills every time. So bravo for that. Absolutely. And I think that's what's really important about before we enter into kind of voicing and into orchestration, our colouring, shading, and all of the, you know, taking this very blank kind of 2D canvas that we create and, 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 and getting our airbrushes out. I think it's really important to find a sound that you find inspiring uh, to work with. And, and often what you'll find and what I find is you can knock stuff up very quickly with your ensembles and merely just put a few extra bits in to give your directors, if film and TV composing is what you do, um, it, it is to kind of give a sense of where you're going with the orchestration with the director without kind of piling in there um, uh, with, with, with all of those different kind of meticulous uh, methods of working. But I think what we haven't done yet, I mean, I'm really pleased that it sounds OK as it currently is. But what we haven't, sorry, talked about is expression. And this is, I think, one of the key errors that people make when they're programming orchestral is the need to express yourself. And I guess that's one of the, the things that it, you really benefit from working with live musicians to, is to actually watch how they produce a single note. It isn't flat. It isn't stuff being triggered on like samples. It isn't um, a synth. And whatever you give them, they will always emote into that note. So we have several different forms of expression. We have MIDI expression, which I always describe as a method in which you balance the instrument you're playing against the rest of the band. It's basically volume. And then we have timbral expression, uh, dynamic expression. And what that does is actually crossfade through various different recordings of the orchestra. So let's have a listen to the flautando again. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's still a very soft tone, but you'll hear a definite timbral shift. Now, I don't know if this is poor practice, but I tend to use, because I come from a showbiz family, so it's all a bit jazz hands for me, I tend to use a combination of expression and uh, the dynamic control to give me much more kind of bandwidth. If you get these little dropouts, it's the actual controller I'm using. It's got um, little dusty pots, so apologies for those. Now, on the kind of mention of theatrical, naturally, film, TV, games music is theatrical, but particularly with drama, film and TV, the reason why orchestral is so... It has so much staying power is because orchestral, the thing that I think def defines something that is symphonic is dynamics, is loud and soft. And what's great about orchestras is you can get them to be loud and soft very quickly. So it's really convenient for ducking behind dialogue and following the emotion of the story you're trying or your director's trying to tell whilst still keeping it sounding like music. This is a little bit more difficult to do with, say, some rock music or some indie music because to suddenly change and shift gears um, is not so idiomatic of that that form of music, which is why I think orchestral music has the staying power it has. Now, often what I will do with the expression, you'll see for you, those of you on Zoom, you'll see I've got my expression controller here, my dynamic here. What you'll often see is um, uh, what, sorry, what I'll often do is, is I'll record my right hand first and then my left hand so I can uh, actually control it whilst I'm programming. So I do something like this. But if I'm in real kind of writing mode, I'll just slap these down like I have done and then record the expression afterwards. And I think if you're looking for advice on shape, it is musicians, string players tend to start slightly softer, build into the dynamic you want and then come back for the next note strike. So that's what I'm going to try and do is imitate these, these kind of wave shapes. What I'll do here is just get up the MIDI so you can see what I've done. Let's get this little cheeky chappy out the way. And I'm just going to literally overdub the expression. It's always very good at the beginning of your piece or cue to give your expression controller a little wiggle to bring you to the point uh, that you want it to be. One of the mistakes I've often made is start doing some expression, say, here, and then when you roll back here, you'll get whatever you left your MIDI expression. In fact, let me just show you what I mean. I'm going to go... And then if I don't have MIDI expression data here, what will happen is it will kind of pick it up here. So we always need to do a little bit of a mix here. So let's just have a listen to that. And it suddenly kind of jumps and catches up. So always give it a wiggle in your pre-roll. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. So we've got expression. Let's do the modulation. The modulation wheel, CC1, is this kind of default for most libraries for your dynamic control. And expression is CC11. A mistake that people often make, I'm wiggling the first fader here, expression, you see it's to the right of dynamics. The mistake a lot of people make is to put it by CC order, so to put your dynamic control as your first fader, your expression as your second. The dynamic control is the one you want greater detail out of, so I think to use this finger, which has its own dedicated tendon, I believe, is, uh, sorry, that's a rude sign in, in England, um, is, is, is the way to go. So you want your, your index finger to be controlling dynamics and your e expression to be controlling the slightly more kind of just balancing elements of what you're doing. So let's do the expression for this part. Okay, it's just a little bit hot for me. So what I'm going to do is just drag everything down a little bit like that and probably leave the expression where it is. I'll do the same with the harmonics. So what I'll do is I'll just bring those in gradually so they're not so hot at the beginning. Give it a wiggle, nice and low.
there are different ways to express yourself with different styles of articulations. Here I've got some spiccatos and we express ourselves with velocity for these. So the speed in which or how hard you hit your keyboard. Oh, latency. Christian, do you mind if I jump in? Sure. We've got a few questions, and I think sure. that they're, they're Great. definitely relevant. Um, so Saad Bushnak is asking if you can maybe explain a bit more in detail the technical term behind wiggle. Like, what do you mean exactly? Literally wiggling my fingers. So uh, give it a wiggle so it's at the level that you want it. There's the little wiggle that actually just makes sure that your... Um, your, uh, your instrument is going to come in at the correct volume, as opposed to setting the volume, playing it, and then, say, fading it out or fading it up. And then whatever level you left it at the end of the region will be the level when you start playing again. What's really vital about giving a little wiggle is, is playing stuff back to directors. You want to make sure that the, the mix is set via MIDI um, as opposed to where you last left the, um, the, the the project pointer, if you know the marker. I hope that answers that. Yeah. And then Maddie um, was asking, how important is it to you to play the MIDI again versus just copying it from above and then just maybe editing it into the MIDI window? Well, I, I do a mixture of both. It depends on uh, it d depends on the deadline. I think something I'll return to later is the fact that the, 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 the more independent pieces of MIDI information you can put in with humanity, with you responding to each articulation, the more real uh, it'll seem. I mean, this is something that I think is really interesting is the ear is so incredibly sensitive, or rather the brain's interpretation of whatever the ear chucks it is incredibly sensitive. And whilst we can't quite pinpoint these different things, I think there's a sense of knowing based on the fact that, you know, if I was to emphasise that slightly strangely, everyone in this room would go, why did he put the emphasis on the word size? It's a very subtle difference. And I think that that's the same with music. And the secret behind orchestral programming is to understand how the ear has developed to kind of accept and trust this form of music. And if you use the orchestra in a way that it hasn't evolved, it'll just seem queer to the ear. But I think as much human interaction as you can give with your music, the better, particularly where expression is concerned, which is why I spent a little bit of time on, on this one. So I'm just going to lay down these spiccatos, which is kind of short staccato notes. mistake we often make with MIDI is 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 often we will when we want to turn something up we will just like maybe turn the velocity up so it's nice and loud but it suddenly has a very computerized nature and that is becomes very obvious with orchestral programming because what you're actually doing with these different velocity layers is actually going through different recordings at different timbral levels different loudness quietness mp mf all of that kind of stuff so Let's hear it kind of bites a little bit more the harder you hit it. So be very wary when you want to turn up and down your staccatos of turning up and down the MIDI. Much, much better to turn up and down either your track or your expression. And also, when writing orchestral kind of short parts that use velocity, just think about how you accent these things. Again, very rare that an orchestra would go da 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 da. It's more likely to be ya da 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 da. And the way you accent these things will really bring out the musicality of your orchestral piece. So let's just try that one more time. with the help of a little bit of quantize. So already these little accents, I think, are helping out. 
So let's move along to legato, which is a third way in which we express ourselves. And what's very key about legato is these are joined up notes. They're monophonic. They only play one note at a time. And the way in which most orchestral libraries understand how to produce legatos is for you to overlap the notes. If I don't overlap them, it kind of rebows for each one. Now on this particular library, which is the chamber strings, uh, it, depending on how loud you hit it, will actually switch between the articulation. So. And this is a great way, again, of creating really expressive parts. Now, in the original uh, string part that I put down here, there is a little line. So what I'm going to do is just going to turn that up a bit and lay that down. And I'll try and get maybe some different legato techniques in there. But if not, I can always edit it afterwards. So let's just have a go with that. That's what that's doing is it's really kind of bringing out that slightly kind of melodic um, part that's in the middle of the harmony so it doesn't just sound like a synth pad. What I'm going to do is just a little bit of post-production on this just to, to make sure that everything's overlapping. I'll have this in solo. That looks all overlapped to me. So I'll return to that shortly. The other interesting thing and the final piece of expression uh, that we can operate is also vibrato, which is the way in which string players will kind of wiggle their fingers to create this kind of passionate sound. So if I just have a listen to this part, what I might do is something called 50-50, but let's, let's hear it with, without the vibrato first. So what you'll see there is it has a kind of an odd sound. Most string players play with a degree of vibrato. But something that often uh, will happen, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, uh, I don't know, a lot of maybe soul singers will sing using something called 50-50, which is it starts with it kind of with, without vibrato and then you bring the vibrato in. So I'm just going to try a bit of that as well as the expression that we used, the modulation and the uh, CC11 and obviously these lovely legato articulations when they slide into the notes. So here we go. That's the kind of idea. I'm going to record that. Wiggle it down. So those are the kind of various forms of expression that you can input with MIDI. And there's one more I'll come back to later, which is something that is often kind of uh, forgotten about with modern uh, methods of production. Next up, timing. And I think this is a kind of a, a bit of a contentious uh, uh, discussion because uh, what happens is, is there's, there's, when you play an instrument, you have a thing called action and then you have the note. If you look at a piano, the beta goes down and there's a whole kind of interaction between you hitting the key and that triggering the beta, a damper coming off, it hitting a string and then this whole action of inertia of the string starting to vibrate. The more you cut your samples into just the note, the less real they sound. So good orchestral libraries will make sure that it will include, for example, the tuba playing player having to blow into his instrument for the air to have to circulate to a point at which the instrument is playing. You can hear the actual note that there's a kind of and then a um is really kind of, it's a massive gap between the and the uh. 
So what we have to do, uh, and this is it's something you just get used to with orchestral programming, is once you've laid your parts in and maybe quantize them, I think I would recommend not quantizing them too strictly. So I always have a little bit of a rule of maybe 50% there. You then have to, compared to your click, try and drag them ahead of the beat. Now, musicians, when they're playing live, will do this naturally. Uh, this is why piano players, when they switch to synths, always play frustratingly ahead of the beat. Guilty as charged. So let's put the click on. For any of you DJs out there, you'll hear that that's slightly behind uh, the beat. So don't be shy. You can go mega. And what I'm going to do is pre-delay here. And you really, as I say, you can go mega. And you'll find that this will help keep your arrangements together. Now, this doesn't just apply to short notes, it applies to long, and the long notes will, particularly these kind of quiet flautandos, will really take a long time to sound. So let's try and find a good point so this all feels together. I'm gonna to do a pre-delay massive one. And on the harmonics. That'd be good enough for jazz. Now the legatos are particularly laggy because basically what the sampler is doing is working out what note you're on and then the next note you play, it works out what note you're going to and it inserts the in-between bit in between those two samples. So there is much more of a lag. So I'm gonna bring that right forward and also the way that that glissando worked, the slidey bit, I'm gonna drag that even more forward. So let's just do a general thing of like maybe a hundred. That's badly quantized that. Let's check it. Okay. Usually with orchestral players, you want them, the note they're going to, to be at the point at which you want the note to be. So you'll get them to gliss into the note. And at the moment, what we're doing is we're triggering that transition at the point where we actually want the destination note to be heard. So I'm gonna really drag that along here. Let's have a listen to this. It's nice, still a bit laggy. Maybe like there. Now, I liked it where it was before. It had a kind of a passionate uh, laziness about it. So timing, a real key to think about. And as I say, with your short passages, don't be tempted to quantize stuff too much. Again, our ear will go, that's impossibly regimented, impossibly computerized. Miriam, any other questions before I move to the next rule? It's a very active chat at the moment, but I'm, I'm happy to report that our community is answering each other's questions, which is really Great. nice because um, I can't keep up. But uh, there is one thing in particular that I thought would maybe be interesting. Um, do you keep two versions of your session, say one with everything on grid in case you're getting a live recording and need those to be notated, um, and then maybe another slightly off grid to get rid of the lag for a demo? Uh, no, uh, what what I find I do is is um, uh, orchestration when you're physically converting something into a chart dots. Um, I will then go through a, a whole housekeeping process at that point, but I won't bother until the very end of the process because, as we know, with film and TV stuff changes and you have to redo stuff. So basically, if it sounds good. I'm happy with that. And then I'll worry about, excuse my French, there's a, a fantastic composer called Paul Englishby who's done some orchestration for me. And he said, you know, orchestration is very easy when someone gives you a logic file, which is the door I work on, um, in the sense of, of, of making sense of it. But it's the cleaning up of the bat shit that takes all the time. And he refers to it as bat shit because it's just it's just a haze of notes that are ahead of the beat that have all of this uh, uh, expression and modulation data and stuff like that and they tend to have to clear all of that out and if you've got a nice and friendly orchestrator if you're using an orchestrator they'll do that for you but 
as I say, when I'm working on uh, low budget stuff, I just go through a housekeeping process before creating those charts. Right. Next up. Right, where are we at? Tambra. The thing about orchestral, it's not just about dynamic, it's about the number of colours that you can get. So I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to be really repetitive. I'm going to switch maybe the uh, lead kind of instrument. That legato string to maybe a bassoon playing exactly the same melody. What I'm going to do is just going to turn those. I'm actually purposely going to turn the velocity down. So not only are we going quieter on the spiccatos, but we're actually playing quieter dynamic layers. So you can really hear this beautiful bassoon. As a composer, you think, okay, well, we need like a, a part B of that melody. Well, it's not necessary with an orchestra because all you have to do is maybe just flip it to a different instrument. So instead of a bassoon, I'm going to play exactly the same thing with an alto flute. We we'll need to turn that up. Always reminds me of um, Pink Panther. So you see, instantly your, your, your attention is being kept, these voices are changing, and you have all sorts of other ways of really kind of keeping people's attention span and uh, just keeping it alive with different ideas. I think the thing I often hear with orchestral programming is the minute someone introduces a new sound, it's like you need to use that all the time. And it, it can be just these little pointillistic textures, like maybe a couple of pizzicato notes. Maybe in the right note there, though, Henson. Or indeed, a little chime. Let's get down. And it may be a little bass drum here as well. So let's just listen to this section. So I think that's the thing that I would really encourage when really investigating orchestral is that something that defines orchestral music is all of these amazing different colours that you can adopt and switch between different voices and I think that that's a, a really good way of thinking of these different instruments, different voices and you get these call and responses, all of those kind of things. Empathy. I think that this is something that is possibly one of the most crucial things about um, orchestral programming is, is trying to understand what the player is having to do. So often when I've been like demoing sounds, someone will jump up and play some mad kind of uh, stride piano honky tonk thing with a flute sample. And you're like, well, that's not going to sound very real because the instrument isn't designed to do that. And I think that we must see that the evolution of orchestral music goes hand in hand with the evolution of instruments and the technology. You know, we, we try and make a sound on an instrument and then we go, wouldn't it be greater if that in instrument was better at making that sound or that style of melody? 
And then we can make that melody and we go, oh, wow, now we can do this melody. And I think there's a this kind of collaborative evolution that's happened between instruments. And as a consequence, orchestral music has itself evolved. And if you ignore what our brains have been conditioned to understand as orchestral music, you'll find that it just becomes less kind of believable. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up a concert flute player and I'm just going to double up the bassoon and the alto flute all the way and demonstrate a very easy way in which you can emphasise, empathise rather, with the instrument. So here's our lovely flute. Okay, I'm going to turn it up a bit. Okay, I think the octave down is good. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to breathe out whilst playing it in. And when I run out of breath, whilst most flute players have a much bigger lung capacity than I do, I know it's probably about time to think of a good gap in which they can take a breath. And all of these tiny little observations, these little empathetic observations, will mean that your music is more believable, I hope. Let me demonstrate. I think that then what I would probably do is introduce similar breathing patterns within the bassoon. And again in the alto flute. And then hopefully already, just on a psychological level, it just starts feeling a little bit more human. It doesn't sound any different. We're just responding to it in our brain as if there are some actual humans playing it. So let's have a listen to that. And this can apply to string players, you know, you'll often hear or you'll often see composers rather be very surprised that a string section can't go da -da 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 with pizzicato, all of those kind of things. So this really kind of leans into trying to, and this doesn't mean like massive amounts of textbooks, which tend to be kind of quite abstract, but this leans into a point that I'll be coming to later on, which is the most important inve investment I think you can uh, make in your future as an orchestral composer. How are we doing, Miriam? Apart from you wanting me um, to hurry up. Apart from that, we're doing great. <laughs> so next up is uh, voices. And as I say, you know, this is something not to be scared of. Um, voicing is taking your pads and giving them to the individual sections or players that you want. And it really is incredibly simple. And where MIDI uh, composition is concerned, you will get greater reality by actually giving each finger that you have, which is like your voice, to a different section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the uh, first legatos, and I'm just going to lay those in here. Um, but actually, they're actually the second violins because they're underneath the first. Now, what I could simply do is go into my arrangement here and copy it down to here. Let me just copy it into the firsts and to the violas, the cellos, and the basses. And it's a really simple rule. Basically, the section players, if the second violins are going above them in pitch, they will feel weird. There's a simple pitch hierarchy. So all you have to do when you're looking at voicing your different parts is to basically separate your parts into those voices. So the highest part, which is just this continuous note here, goes into the firsts, 
we've already done the seconds. So that's the second part. Da, 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 da. So we get rid of those. We've got this very stationary part, surprise, surprise, in the violas. And then we've got these octave parts in the basses and cellos here. And here. That's it. I've voiced that entire part. It really is as simple as that. But what I'd also recommend doing is to actually play those parts in one at a time. Not only because you will give them different kind of expression and modulation, which, which will again just make it feel like it's different players, different sections playing this stuff, but because you'll also try and find better voicing, make them more like little melodies that they can play into, if you know what I mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these away and I'm just going to start with the basses and the cellos, octaves. I'm going to do a little trick here. I'm actually going to transpose this one down minus 12. Does that work? No, I'm going to do it on the... This is one of my little tricks. Uh, because basses are actually written an octave below or rather sound an, oct oct an octave below their written. I think it's quite a cool trick. I keep on clicking that on. Sorry, guys. <sighs> there we go. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into advance and I'm going to transpose minus 12. Okay. Which will give me, hopefully, between the basses and the cellos, the octaves. And then when we repeat that, you'll get dum bam. So I've already found a little bit of something extra in there. So the next part we've got is our static G here. Let's see not only if we can enter in some nice, interesting expression, but also um, maybe just a passing note here and there to, to give us more interest. And then finally, the firsts, which are this sustained note I was doing before. So instantly we're starting to create more voices, more of a choral kind of environment. And as I say, you know, I could put that in flutes or bassoons. Voicing stuff isn't something that you should be scared of by any means. It, again, it's just slightly more detailed colouring. On to the next one, Miriam. Yeah, just really quick. Charlotte was wondering, um, the, the melody here seems to be born out of the first chord progression that you played on the piano. Do you ever just write the melody first? Um... No, because I'm a terrible singer. So m melody and being melodious is not doesn't come naturally to me. I'm I'm my, my background is drum and bass. So if I could start with like an 808 kick, I would. But obviously, uh, on a track like this, it wouldn't be appropriate. My melodies as a composer tend to be very simple, but I'll just try and stick the knife in with the chords and you know dropping down a minor third and all of those cheesy tricks. Next up, the lost art of tempo. And this is something that I think is just, you know, that's the other thing that's just amazing about orchestral music is that you're not having a bunch of teenagers playing drums. So I sound like such an old man, boomer speaking here. Uh, you know, kind of keeping something kind of metronomic to dance to. Orchestras ebb and flow. And if you actually listen to some, some proper kind of repertoire, it's insane. If you were to draw a tempo map of what they're doing, it's absolutely nuts how they're also expressing themselves with tempo. Now, earlier on, I found this part felt a little bit pacey. And I've spoken about voices and stuff, and I've always thought that really the job of a film and TV composer is to help tell the story. And I think if you're telling a story, you know, you take gaps between, well, I don't, but you, you know, you take pauses between what you're talking about, your chapter marker, markers, your, your page turns, that kind of stuff. So maybe what might be nice here is to just slow it down a little bit and then just have a little, not a pause, but just 
kind of before we get into the motion of the piece, just a little bit of a slowdown and then a bit, a bit of a speed up. And obviously this would be different depending on whatever uh, door you're using. But let me just have a look at tempo, tempo operations, and I'm just going to basically take it down to, you know, and again, don't be shy, just like w with my pre-delay. Uh, I, I want it to be gradual. I don't want, want to feel the kind of steps as you go down there. And then what I'm probably going to do is just going to go again from 9, from 80, not 105. This is all very crude because I'm doing it live, but I do actually spend quite a lot of time massaging the tempo. And uh, I've worked with composers like Dario Marinelli who will actually not work with any click whatsoever. So they'll just write against the picture, follow the tempo of the piece, and then click their track up afterwards. Now, in many countries, handing someone a massive click track with peaks and troughs will be problematic. But if you're working with musicians in the UK, that will not be a problem for them at all. They have at least 30 years of experience doing this. So that's just yet another expression tool within our arsenal. We've got our various forms of input, vibrato, expression, modulation, and we've got our loud and our soft. We've got our timbral expression, but also we've got that of speed. Next up, the glue of life, or as I call it, splosh or gravy. And don't be purist about this. The stuff that will make your orchestral programming sound more like orchestral recordings will be a bit of reverb. Because orchestral recordings use reverbs to enhance the sound. When you see something live, you're taken in by the 3D quality of the sound. And when we record it, we tend to have to hype this up a bit to give you that sense of what it would be like to be in the concert hall. What's more, if you are writing for film and TV, um, uh, what you'll find is beneath dialogue and room noise is that you lose all of the top end. So you lose all of this gorgeous sense of space that these samples have. That kind of gets lost. So you do have to enhance it a bit. So what I'm going to do is just going to create a bus here, going out to one. And I've got an auxiliary here and I... Uh, what we're looking for is a nice warm hall. Now, this is fantastic. Not sponsored by these guys, but uh, I do like their reverbs. Got this um, FabFilter Pro reverb. I'm looking for large. And the one that I really like is, where is it? Vienna. There we are. And you keep that as 100%. So basically, these still are sending dry signals to your stereo out, and then you're accompanying them with a bit of splosh. Now, for something like these spiccatos... That's an awful lot of reverb. Because they're already quite reverberant, I'll probably put just a tad less for them. And the same for the pizzicatos. I'll probably take that down a bit. And then for these uh, cheeky atmospheric things, maybe uh, just a little bit more. The glue of life. And again, I think that, that that is also the way in which you will be able to glue live music into your orchestral programming uh, that you're doing, you know, your sampled programming, if you will. Um, the thing that I never, ever wanted to do with Spitfire Audio was to put musicians out of work. For me, 
uh, orchestral sampling enables a bloke who came out of comprehensive school to write music for orchestras. And I've written about 50 film scores using orchestras and I got up and conducted once and I won't ever do that again. But I think it's also very important to gain experience working with musicians. So whatever project you're working on, I just don't know of any excuse why you shouldn't try and work with at least one musician, it, whether it give them a pint or, you know, just try and spend a little bit of that fee on working with musicians. I think it's really important to get that experience. Most film scores you hear will not all be recorded in the same room. Often they'll be recorded in Abbey Road and Air Studios and then there'll be an overdub, say, done in this shed here. And this reverb will really glue stuff together for you. And it's uh, there's no excuses there. Do work with your musicians. Get your experience of getting the best out of them. They make our music so much easier to, to produce. We have to work so, le so much less hard. Before I move on to the last point, Miriam, are there any questions? Yeah, there was a question about reverb. Do you usually write with it or add it on during mixing? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I put the makeup on everything and just sparkly dress everything. I want it sounding lovely. I used to actually write in 5.1 just because it was so gorgeous. Put all the splosh on and enjoy it. And again, also what it helps you do is actually write into the the, the samples. It helps you write with how it's going to sound. And I think that the one thing that you'll always be asked to do is to do less. And with stuff like reverb and the timbral differences I'm talking about, you can run melodies under dialogue without having to change the melody and maybe pull focus. You're just going from the alto flute to the bassoon and all of that kind of stuff. So that's that's my approach anyway. Right. Take us home. Final um, uh, uh, rule is that the biggest and most important investment that you will make in your career as an orchestral programmer is to listen. Uh, you can buy lots of textbooks, and I, I own them. Some are, uh, are thumbed, some aren't. The problem with them is they're deeply abstract if you're not used to uh, that practical application of what you're, you're learning. So what I would recommend more than reading books um, Obviously, reading books is great as well, but is to listen and to listen every moment you possibly have. And to quote the great John Powell, amazing film composer, whatever you do, don't listen to fucking film music. But in all seriousness, as I say, orchestral music is an evolution that is a collaboration between our environments, our experience, what we've learned from one another, but also the evolution of these instruments. And the more you listen and understand how orchestral music works and actually how some of the great classics I mean, if you want hits, Nutcracker is a great starter because every three minutes you're handed something that you think was orchestrated differently, but often it'll just be so amazingly simplistic. So that's the one, I would say, most important golden rule of orchestra, orchestral programming is to listen because that is where you will learn everything. And just hearing the fact that for example, um, you know, piccolo players uh, can play forever and very low brass players can't play forever because it requires a lot more lungs and all of that kind of stuff. And it's not that you have to form that analysis. It's just if you absorb this stuff when you go to write it, it will be innate in you. And so, you know, remember that the ear is a really wonderful thing or certainly what our uh, brain can do with it. So in conclusion... Don't worry about using ensembles. That's your compositional tool. Pick those articulations that match the mood. Use expression. It's there to be used. Express yourself with modulation, dynamics, um, expression with vibrato, with timbre, with speed. Timing, pre-delay is absolutely fundamental to creating successful sounding orchestral um, uh, pieces. Use your timbre, the orchestras use there for you to use, even if you're just using strings, flip through your articulations. Empathise with the players. Um, violinists can't go, dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig, surf guitar on pizzicato, so don't write it. Express yourself with tempo. Don't be scared of voicing. Smack some splosh on it. And for God's sake, listen to good music, which in an easy to remember acronym is it, it, it's a little. There you go. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Christian. That was a great wrap up. <laughs> um, Can I drink beer right, now? So, yeah, no, please. Cheers to Take you so I hope that wasn't too kind of basic. And even for many of you who are massively experienced, there was just some 
different ways of thinking about stuff there. But any questions I'd, about this or anything else? Indeed, uh, happy happy to answer. Um, well, we've got a lot of thank yous. People are quite grateful for this. So, of course, absolute pleasure. Thanks for sharing the genius, the experience, and the brilliance with us. Um, we do have a question from Alvaro. In general, how do you avoid the re-trigger sound with long notes in any Spitfire string library legato or long patch? Um, it's not a problem I, I have. The thing to do, and this is something that Jake Jackson, who's our engineer, screams at me about, is uh, no musician uh, playing a stringed instrument or indeed probably a wind instrument will stop dead. So basically, when you come to the end of a note, roll it off because no musician goes derp like that. They'll always go derp. Even bass players, I've seen my brother do it, will roll off the note as he comes to an end. So if you're feeling a jump, you just, you've got to roll those notes off in order for them to work effectively. Great. Um, someone has asked if there's uh, you know, any chance we can get a hint about who this uh, special guest is for the next Zoom course, but I'm going to go ahead and say nope. No, nope. because also they haven't, nope. Sally hasn't told me, so um, I don't know. <laughs> Even better. Um, okay, and it looks like we have one more question. We'll round it out. Why would you say um, listening to classical music and musicians is maybe a little bit more um, inspired than film composers? Or is that something that you, you know? No, I mean, I, when I say, I mean, the word classical is is a is a very broad canvas. I I don't actually like the classical era per se, the kind of Mozarty stuff. I know it sounds terrible to say that. I like a bit of baroque, but I'm a big fan of the very challenging music of the 20th century. I spoke to um one of my favourite film composers, Cliff Martinez, who's absolutely obsessed about not repeating himself and doing original stuff. And he said it's really simple, really. You just take three diverse artists and try and combine them he he goes well i'm going to take led zeppelin and and some uh i don't know some barbershop brass band music and uh some edm music of the 1980s in sheffield in england chances are that the bits from those different influences you're going to take are not going to be the same as the bits someone else takes if they decide to combine those very strange, disparate influences. So as a consequence, you'll probably come up with something interesting. It'll con probably create a tension along the way. I don't know. I think it's good to keep the gene pool fresh. And I think if we're all copying each other in this relatively small industry, uh, I think that um, I think our children will suffer. All right, Christian. Thank you so much again for this, for your time and expertise. So thanks as ever for watching to the end. And thank you, all of you, for joining me on Zoom. And so nice to see some familiar faces as well. If you haven't subscribed yet, well, there's more summer classes coming up soon. So please hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much, Miriam, for your fantastic mediation skills. But also to the uh, Spitfire type team who you can't see here who have put this fantastic series together. It's been a technological challenge, but we got there. And I doff my caps to all of you. So one of them for all of that lot will be much appreciated. See you next time.